Chapter 10 in the Gospel of Matthew focuses Jesus' discourse of missionary discipleship. Verses 17 through 39 stress the cost of discipleship. Jesus concludes that these verses by telling us to take up our crosses and those who find their life will lose it and those who lose their lives for his sake will find it. Now in verses 40 through 42, Jesus instructs us to continue his own work by serving others. Indeed, the person we choose to serve may be God himself in disguise. For instance, we learn in Genesis chapter 18 that when Abraham unknowingly served angels, he turned out to be serving the Lord God in disguise. Or consider Luke's gospel where the, gospel, where the disciples on the road to Emmaus unknowingly invited Jesus to have dinner with them. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus instructs that when we serve those in prison or hunger or in need, we are serving him. In today's reading, Jesus assures his disciples that the people who will receive his disciples are really receiving Christ and the Father who sent him. Jesus clearly says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me and welcomes the one who sent me. This idea is based upon the well-established Jewish concept that when, re when one receives a person's envoy, this amounts to receiving the person, him or herself. To honor a person's representative is equivalent to honoring the person who sent the envoy. The privilege of being a disciple is simply the privilege of continuing Jesus' mission. It is the opportunity to honor God and Christ by representing God to the world in two ways. First, by preaching the gospel. Second, by imitating Christ's deeds. When we act for Christ, we neither act for our own glory, nor do we act by our own power. We are rather the hands and feet of our Lord. Christ's active power is using us, his witnesses. When we act, we are enacting the Lord's prayer petition, which reads, hallowed be thy name, and we are enabling God's kingdom to come. When we receive or honor a person, we receive the same kind of blessing in our own life. When we honor someone, we choose to put their needs, their wants, their cares above our own. The word receive may be understood in this context to mean to encourage, to help, to pray for, to give assistance, all such actions help bring forth the kingdom of God. The person who receives a righteous person in the name of that person shall receive a righteous person's reward. Now we may extend this thought to include ordained ministers, missionaries, Sunday school teachers, and furthermore, to anyone whose character has been transformed in the gospel and walks in faith. Different people may fill different positions in the church, but all service ranks the same with God. All who participate in a, in a work or a ministry done for God, are equal partners in God's eyes. Jesus said, 
He who receives a prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. And he added, whoever gives even a, a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, will not lose his reward. Perhaps we had better explain what is meant by the term reward. Paul teaches in Ephesians that we do not do good deeds in order to be saved. We do not do good deeds in order to be saved. Rather, we are first saved, then acting out of gratitude, we do good deeds. In the same way, a reward is not something earned or deserved. It is not a carrot. The act of unselfish service is well illustrated by giving a cup of cold water motivated by the love of God. In John's Gospel, we are given the story of the Samaritan woman who gave Jesus a cup of cold water to drink. In Jesus' world, giving a drink of water had far more significance than we might think. Obtaining water meant going to a spring or to a well, which might be far off and required significant sacrifice. Another example of sacrificial giving is told about Veronica, a renowned legendary godly woman who is remembered by the church in the sixth station of the cross. Saint Veronica was so moved by the sight of Jesus carrying his cross to Golgotha that she gave Christ her handkerchief to wipe his brow. When Jesus handed it back, it bore the image of his face on it. We today, the modern disciples of Christ, may be known by our godly acts of kindness and our reverence for God. A modern example of honoring God happened in the 1924 Olympic Games. The incident was captured in a scene of the movie Chariots of Fire. Eric Little was on the British track team. He is remembered for refusing the request of the future king of England to run a race on the Sabbath. This refusal came at great personal cost to, to Little as the Prince of Wales was very angry. The next day, a Monday, Little was racing a different race, a race he had never been trained to run, a race he had never expected to run. Jackson Schultz, an American competitor who was aware of Little's sacrificial act on Sunday, just before the race, he handed Little a verse from 1 Samuel. There, in that verse, God speaking himself says, those who honor me, I will honor. Well, Little ran the race Monday victoriously, and he won the gold medal. Those who honor me, I will honor. Some years ago, a young pastor in my community told me about the following incident, which happened to him. His elderly mother lived in Kelowna and was quite sick. The pastor wanted to visit her, but he did not have the money to make the trip. Someone anonymously put $600 in an envelope and left it on his desk with a note which read, go see your mother. Many of our acts require of a sacrifice of talent, of time, or of money. 
At St. Paul's, we are helping to provide a water truck to indigenous people in Northern Ontario. And we are every day feeding the hungry through our breakfast program. All of us are individually called to give sacrificially, and God does remember what we do, for God watches carefully and caringly over all of God's creation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.